Well, uh, uh, good morning. Thank you uh, so much uh, for being here for this uh, press conference. Uh, Join with me is Stacy uh, uh, Felter, Felter, and she's the uh, murder victim's mom. Also have Assistant State Attorney and uh, Division Chief Dan Faggard, who's the uh, prosecutor in this case. We also have some in the back of the room that are here with us that are off camera. I want to thank uh, some of the County Sheriff's Office Captain Sammy Gibson, who oversees our Drug Enforcement and Behavioral Services uh, Division. And of course, we have a unique and solid partnership with the local DEA. And we have the group supervisor, uh, Josh uh, Baker, uh, here with us uh, today. Uh, as you saw in the press release, uh, it's nothing new for us to have press conferences and talk about the deadly uh, hazards of, of, of fentanyl poisonings and drug overdoses across the country. Uh, we've, we've taken a proactive approach uh, in recent years to make sure that people who are suffering with substance use disorder uh, and addiction are, are given access to the medical support and needs to promote recovery and sobriety. Uh, by now, everyone has heard uh, the story of how we got started down this path with overprescribing of, of largely Oxycontin and legitimately uh, obtained pills. Uh, again, doctors thought this was incredibly safe, uh, started to prescribe, and then when they found out it was not safe, started to weed people off those drugs, uh, creating this unprecedented dependency and addiction. 80% uh, of the people who are now addicted to some type of opioid were at one time legally prescribed by somebody that they trusted, a medical doctor, and again, with a, not a political statement, but with a, with a uh, concern at the border and fentanyl coming across like, like never before, we're seeing this affect all of our communities across the country. So what we have here is the unfortunate case once again uh, of a murder victim, Tristan Buttram, a uh, 27-year-old uh, male who, who died on January 2nd. Uh, sheriff's deputies were called uh, to his home after a roommate uh, located him at the location with a pressed fentanyl pill of M30 Percocet uh, on the night table. Uh, our SCORE detectives, and that's the Seminole County Opioid Response Team, one that you've covered, we've talked about uh, quite a bit. Our SCORE detectives immediately responded to that location and started to, to conduct a criminal investigation for the murder. Uh, part of the, the process of that is to grab and, and forensically examine a phone or try to have some level of communication with the drug dealer. Uh, at the beginning, we were uh, keeping that a little bit secret as a strategy, but we want everyone to know that, that if you are dealing drugs, we're going to track you down and hold you accountable and responsible. And that's exactly what our detectives did on that day on January 2nd. They were able to go through uh, uh, Tristan's phone and identify a person uh, simply identified as dude on the inside of the phone. Uh, detectives in a short matter of time were able to track Dew down and do some investigative techniques and ultimately come in contact with him in Winter Springs where he was subsequently arrested for trafficking of fentanyl. He, he later then worked with our state attorney's office and our detectives because it's just not arresting and holding accountable the first line dealer. Our intent is to go for larger people who are in this criminal enterprise that are capitalizing on on destruction and murder and selling this poison. So ultimately, this arrestee became a confidential informant working with our detectives and state attorney's office and ultimately led us to three uh, additional indictments after a true bill was delivered from a grand jury for first degree murder on three individuals. What is uh, unique about this is two of these individuals are relatively local uh, into the central Florida area. Uh, one is Bradley Hunter, a date of birth, 725 of 97. He is from Kissimmee. Uh, we have uh, uh, Vincetti Diaz, who is from St. Cloud. And again, which is incredibly unique, is one of our defendants in this case, Andreas Rea, uh, actually lives in Los Angeles, California. So again, we, we were able to track back that uh, Hunter uh, had worked with our confidential informant and at one time delivered uh, more than 40,000 pills to the central Florida area that were, were fentanyl uh, pressed pills. 
uh, Hunter and our confidential, confidential informant in December uh, went over to Los Angeles where they met with Rhea. Uh, they had a conversation about drug dealing. We believe Rhea to be two levels removed from the Mexican drug cartel, uh, three levels up from this drug dealing that's going on here locally. And they made arrangement to have 40,000 pills uh, shipped uh, to Central Florida. Out of the 40,000 pills, 500 of those pills were received by our confidential informant. One of those pills is responsible for the murder of Tristan. Uh, again, working with us, we found out that uh, Vincetti Diaz uh, has a history in the past of drug dealing and drug charges. Actually, when, when he was arrested, he was already in custody in Osceola County. There were 5,000 pills that were located at his residence. Uh, as far as Diaz, we know of no criminal involvement and criminal history uh, involving uh, him. Reyes in Los Angeles, who is now in custody in the Los Angeles County Jail, waiting extradition back to Seminole County to face murder, murder charges, uh, has some charges of cruelty to animals and some drug-related uh, charges in the past. So again, this is a, another uh, example of a tragic murder that has occurred. Uh, I intentionally use the word murder because I think that there's some confusion out there with, with terminology. I think that the majority of jurisdictions across this country, quite frankly, are still calling these accidental overdoses. And granted, uh, you can overdose on a substance that is legal or illegal, but what we're dealing with here is different because people are taking a substance that has been uh, unknowingly poisoned to the, to the level of lethal doses, and that's exactly what this is, a murder case. And you can see how quickly we can come back with three first-degree murder indictments on people who are responsible for this particular murder and this particular death. Uh, Tristan's story is, is a story that we've heard time and time again. Tristan was legally prescribed pain pills by a doctor for a legitimate medical condition several years ago. Uh, had, had built up this dependency at no fault uh, of his own. This is biologically what happens when somebody is prescribed the drugs. They can no longer get the drugs. Nothing replaces that. This is a narrative that we've heard time and time and time again. Uh, we've talked about it statistically, but now we're talking uh, once again with photographs of this, this innocent uh, young man that has been a victim to this epidemic. We've made some progress here in Seminole County, right? You've covered those, those things that we're doing, this unique partnership with Advent Health. Uh, Advent Health has opened the Hope and Healing Center, and it's incredibly important that everyone knows that if you are struggling, you know somebody struggling, nobody is turned away from our Advent Health partnership and facility. Uninsured, underinsured, it is incredibly important that if you know somebody that's struggling with this, allow our team and the Advent Health team to help navigate you and your family towards a path of sobriety. Uh, in Seminole County alone, we have 518 fatal poisonings or over overdoses year to date. Uh, we have 87 unfortunate fatalities of poisoning or overdoses year to date. And that represents a 21% decrease in, in poisonings and overdoses and a 22% decrease uh, in deaths. So you can see how alarming these numbers are. Uh, these numbers are actually better than, than jurisdictions that you'll find across the state uh, and the country. Uh, we've had 118 deployments of, of the life-saving drug naloxone. Again, we talk about uh, the properties of naloxone a lot. This quite literally saved lives. You can, you can get it in the form of Narcan. Uh, there's other Cloxados, an eight milligram form. It's a stronger form. Every single person that knows somebody or runs a business should get this. You can now get this over the counter, walk into a pharmacy, get it. Simply squirt it in somebody's nose when they go out unconscious and not breathing, and it gives them 90 minutes of life. If we can get them hospitalized within 90 minutes, uh, we can save their life and pull them down a path uh, towards sobriety. Again, we're seeing an increase in citizens actually deploying this. In Seminole County alone, a 39% increase in citizens deploying naloxone. And the raw number of that is 71 times in Seminole County, a citizen has actually deployed this to somebody. And that's simply uh, what we know of. 
Uh, a lot of people did a lot of work in this case. I, I of course, want to uh, thank our Seminole County Collaborative Opioid Response Team, particularly the investigators that worked directly with this case. Uh, because of the type of work they do is undercover capacity, they're not able to come out there and be publicly praised for the work. But I will tell you, they are incredibly passionate about finding justice and closure for these families. Um, it, is, it is so important that this happens because if you think about 40,000 pills and one pill out of that 40,000 is responsible for the, for the murder of Tristan, how many other people from that same dose of 40,000 pills had had similar fate but are not having good, solid, effective working relationships with their state attorney, with the DEA, uh, and with their team to treat these as homicide cases. It is incredibly important that we shift the narrative and we, and we start doing that. Uh, I want to thank our legislative body because, as you know, and you've covered this, because of the work that we've done here in Seminole County, we have actually changed Florida's law uh, to allow it to be easier to prosecute these cases. Uh, at first, it was um, uh, proximate cause of death that was required in murder cases. That has been changed to substantial factor, and we've added in some additional uh, laws that allow us to charge people criminally. So in the event that somebody does um, um, overdose or they're, f they're fatally poisoned and we revive them with the use of naloxone, now we can charge them with second-degree felony culpable negligence because of the work that we've done here. Prior to that, they quite literally were getting away with murder. So again, I want to thank our legislative body. I want to thank uh, Governor Ron DeSantis for signing the laws in, in, uh, in, into effect. And I want to thank our, uh, again, members of our grand jury that had uh, heard this case in, in the middle of October, uh, came back with a true bill delivery on three counts of first degree murder. And I think that this is the message we want to get out there is we want to get higher level tiers within the drug trafficking organizations. Just a, a last moment on, on the cartel. We talk about the cartel uh, quite a bit. Uh, we know that when it was legally prescribed drugs, we really didn't have the, the major cartels working in the fentanyl business. They were still uh, working their operations with organically grown uh, poppy fields and poppy plants and cultivating that. And we had unprecedented addiction and we had uh, heroin problems across this country, which resulted in overdose deaths but nothing like this right now. The DEA says six in every 10 pills on the street or 60% of the pills that are on the street contain a lethal dose of fentanyl on the inside of the pill. We're seeing unprecedented examples of somebody using a pill for the first time that they think is a legitimate pharmaceutical grade pill that are taking it and dying immediately. We've never experienced this in, the, in this country like this. The number one cause of death of young people is now a drug overdose. Uh, the, the average life expectancy of a U.S. citizen is now diminished because of these problems. And what's happening uh, at our southern border with drug trafficking and, and fentanyl, largely with the Sinaloa drug cartel and the Jalisco New Generation cartel is responsible for all of this stuff that's going on out there. I want to thank um, uh, uh, our uh, state attorney for the 18th Judicial Circuit, uh, Phil Archer. Uh, and Dan Fagger, because Dan has really been a champion of these cases, has been uh, nationally recognized uh, on the work that he does and has presented to other jurisdictions across the country how we can do these, this, this work. Uh, lastly, uh, I don't know that if this drug dealer, uh, Rhea, would have done this simply in Los Angeles County, California, that anything would have been done. I think that if it was blatant and obvious what he had, had, had uh, committed, Maybe there would be some actions. I'm not saying that the police authorities and prosecutors uh, in those areas are doing bad work. Uh, I, I simply don't know who they are. But I know this. If you do this here in the state of Florida, if you do this in Seminole County, let there be no mistake about it. You're going to jail and you're going to be charged with murder. This makes 35 or so cases now of, of charging of first degree murder. We have another 10 or 15 at various stages of prosecution. This will continue to happen because we owe it to our community to get our hands around this thing and do all that we can to protect and preserve our community and find justice for families uh, like Tristan, Tristan's family. You can see his mom that's here. Uh, you know, the inspiration and uh, boldness 
of these family members and the courage that they demonstrate to, to come up here and be a part of this process encourages so many other family members and inspires our team, quite frankly, uh, to work harder to make sure that more people are held accountable so this tragedy doesn't affect other families like it has affected yours. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce um, Dan, I don't know if you're going you're gonna to speak. Are you, are you going to speak? Maybe if there's some questions or something like that. Uh, but, uh, but would you like to say a few words? Um, I just want to thank you, um, yes. Sheriff. And also, um, I have a long relationship with uh, the Assistant State Attorney, Dan Faggart. Um, so it's been a very uh, painful experience. Um, and I just want to echo what you were saying. It's been a um, difficult year. Obviously, I lost my beautiful son. He was born this month, uh, 20, almost 28 years ago, in Kettle Dick, Iceland. Um, I was serving in the U.S. Navy when I had him, so he was born uh, at the Naval Air Station, Kettle Dick, Iceland. Um, and he was a wonderful son, and, um, but he did struggle. Um, he was actually stabbed um, by um, somebody uh, five years ago. And that's when um, he was prescribed the Percocet. Um, but I have uh, trusted in the sheriff's office. I've trusted in the state attorney's office that my son would not go um, known for taking drugs and overdosing. Uh, he would not choose that. Um, and it, today, I'm standing here with all the courage he's providing me to say, for the first time, I can announce, and I'm standing next to the sheriff and the, and the assistant state attorney, that my son was murdered. He did not, um, he did not choose this. Um, and um, I know that he's with us right now, and I'm so proud that the Seminole County Sheriff's Office has allowed a press conference and show my son um, because he is going to give me the strength to talk. And I am, I'm getting the strength again. Um, I'm gonna go take a little bit of his ashes back to Keflavik, Iceland. Um, and um, I, I, that'll be after Thanksgiving on his birthday, the 30th of November. And uh, after that and getting through the holidays, um, I want to team up. I will do anything that the sheriff has going on. Um, I'm welcome if anybody wants to reach out to me. I will speak at schools. I, I speak to every mom because I don't want one mom to ever um, go through what I've been through. And um, I'm a criminal defense attorney. Um, I have my own firm in Orlando, and I've been doing criminal defense. Um, but this is outrageous. And to just give somebody one pill to make some money and then they, they're murdered. Um, uh, they need to be prosecuted with first degree murder. I'm so proud that that is what has happened here. And I can stand before you and say that this has got to stop. And we cannot lose one more son or daughter or adult. And families have, have suffered. My family has gone through it. My son, my 21-year-old, looks just like him and uh, sounds like him. And uh, he misses his brother. My parents miss him, uh, his entire family. And um, I'm just honored to be here. It's, take, it was, it's surreal. Um, but um, I just wanted to thank you again, uh, Sheriff, and of course, uh, the state attorney's office for making this happen. It has brought some closure for people that ask me, and my son did not intentionally overdose. He did not take a bunch of pills. He did not kill himself. He was poisoned and killed by these three people over there. Th thank you. Thank you, Stacy. And Thank you for your courage and, and passion about delivering this message to other families. Uh, as, a, as a recap here, uh, what happens is somebody is then prescribed a drug that they become familiar with. In this case, it was Percocet. Uh, they can no longer get access to the drug, so sometimes they order the drug up. They meet somebody that can deliver the drug that looks identical because it's pressed on pill presses. It's marketed to look exactly like the drug that they had safely taken once legally prescribed by a pharmacy. And uh, we know that the, the deadly presence of fentanyl in these drugs is taking people's lives. 100 times more potent than morphine, 50 times more potent than heroin, a microgram equivalent to eight grains of salt is a lethal dose. These are made in clandestine labs, a fancy term for somebody's bathroom. 
uh, precursor chemicals are coming from China. The drug cartels are now manufacturing that with their own chemists. They're coming across the border, and they're either delivered by person or shipped across the country. Again, just this one case, 40,000 pills came over that, that, that we're working with. Uh, our, our three suspects, again, will be charged with first-degree murder. They will be extradited back to Seminole County at our, our Johnny Polk Correctional Facility to face charges. Uh, th this is a, again, true bill from a grand jury that has had the opportunity to look and review this case. Uh, one other thing that I want to mention is, and it's incredibly important, is the Good Samaritan's Law. And, and this allows uh, people that are with somebody that's using a drug, they go unconscious, they're not breathing, hopefully they have Narcan. We see the, the, the effective positive results of Narcan or Naloxone. Uh, but if they report the medical condition that they're experiencing, they are not going to be held accountable, they're not going to be prosecuted because there's protections under the Good Samaritan Law the most important thing for us to do is save somebody's life. And if we never get the call, we've seen the most horrific examples of people dropping lifeless bodies off at the hospital in the parking lot. We don't want that. We want you to call. This isn't just a tough on crime, first degree murder message. It's a tough on crime, first degree murder message, while at the same time, we're giving you unprecedented access to treatment, recovery, regardless of your ability to pay for that call upon us. We will put you, based on the generosity of Advent Health, in the place with the people that can do remarkable work for you. So with that, I'll open for uh, questions. Um, well, I suppose this could be the one when it comes to Mr. Rea. <clears throat> uh, however, I think what's important to, to think about is the, um, the equities of the case. So every case is, every case is different. You know, it's very different um, if you take an individual who is a, an, an addict herself who uh, technically has committed the crime uh, and, and can get charged with it and sometimes does. Uh, but then really doesn't deserve um, a mandatory life, which is which is the only possible penalty for a case like this. Um, and uh, and so I guess that's kind of kind of w the way we look at it. And that's been Mr. Archer's um, overall uh, decision and um, and plan, which is to you know, you know we don't want to. Uh, abuse our prosecutorial discretion. You know, just because we can put someone in prison for the rest of their life doesn't mean they need to go for the rest of their life. So, um, you know, and I think another another situation is, in light of the fact that there is such a stiff penalty and that it's the only possible penalty, uh, a lot of times there's a strong incentive for those defendants to seek out um, plea negotiations, and they frequently do, and that happens more and more often. Um, uh, as, as more of this <coughs> occurs, they know that we're serious about it. They know that we will take it all the way if necessary. And so they say, please, please give me an offer. Is that helpful? Um, you know, I, I think this is early on, so I'd hesitate to say that, you know, here at this point, um, I, I do believe that this may be, uh, one of the more exacerbated cases that we've charged uh, in just, just because of the level of drug dealing and the, the number of pills that were coming in um, continuously. I mean, it wasn't just the one time that, that, uh, that we know of. It was multiple occasions where tens of thousands and in, in some situations hundreds of thousands of pills were coming from Los Angeles through these individuals into Seminole County. Um, so whether this will be the one, we'll We'll have to see. Sure. Question for you? Yes. Hi. So this weekend is EDC Orlando. And just like Tristan, this mother, her son has ripped away from her way too young. And there's going to be young people at this concert this weekend. And we know it's not happening in Seminole County, but I mean, people come from all over the country, all over the state, even the world, to a concert like this where we know there's drug use. We've seen issues with this. Are you? How are you guys preparing for this for the weekend? 
<coughs> well, it's, it's really not just preparing for the weekend because we see this every single day. I mean, you know, it, typically it's about 150 overdose or, or poisoning fatalities per year in Seminole County alone. Uh, the number hovers around 800. Uh, people who have been poisoned. So for us, uh, you know, this is just a, another day in the work that we do. I, I recognize hundreds of members of our agency each year for deploying naloxone. Now, of course, a big event like this into Central Florida brings in kind of this, this uh, attitude that sometimes can lead to more promiscuous behavior and, and, you know, other types of intoxicants. And we're trying to do all that we can to kind of get the word out there. And our media partners have been absolutely wonderful in helping us do that to kind of reshape the narrative because there's something about this particular epidemic that for the user feels safer. Like, like when you're using heroin and tying a rubber band around your arm and pumping up your arm and injecting a needle in your arm and in your veins, there's something very, very intrusive about that. But when somebody goes to a party, opens a pill bottle and says, hey, these are gonna make you relax, there's something for the user that feels less harmful now there's two situations. There's one person who's become addicted and dependent because they were legally prescribed, and that's the story that we have here. And there's others using it for the first time that have no history of using it. They were never prescribed it, but they're looking to have a good time. Six out of every 10 of these pills that would be given at this, whatever type of venue we're talking about, doesn't matter where it's at, six out of every 10 pills that are illegal, that are opened up, will contain fatal doses of fentanyl on the inside. So again, I think the message there is, is don't do it, right? We, we heard the message for years and years, and Nancy Reagan said it a lot, just say no. And just say no absolutely works. Just say no becomes a little bit more difficult if you've already started a regimen. It's like more difficult than that. But there's medical-based treatment therapy, there's cognitive behavioral therapy. If you're going to that party and that fest, make sure that you have this. I know our partners at the Orlando Police Department, the Orange County Sheriff's Office, all have this. They work, they're great partners here. Uh, the DEA has been a remarkable ambassador. They've got one pill can kill. They got Operation Overdrive in 37 major cities across America. They are just absolutely wonderful partners in doing incredible work we as parents and responsible people have to know our family members who are struggling and make sure that we have these, these, these conversations. Like I hope, like I suspect some of you are gonna have this as a live feed on your social media platform. Other people are gonna weigh in with their comments, what a tragedy, uh, I'm praying for you. Some are gonna have other opinions. I hope that they share this feed with their friends, their family members, because the more that we talk about this, the more people are gonna be aware and the more times we hold people responsible for murder. When you say that, 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 that somebody's been murdered from this, it has a different feel than what a tragedy, accidental overdose. This is a fentanyl poisoning and a murder, and that's how we're gonna treat it. And sir, to prevent that murder, as we had just mentioned, uh, you know, what messaging should parents give their kids that they're sending to this concert this weekend, or the young people that are headed there this weekend? Yeah, I, I think that it, it's this message of, of trust but verify. I think that the stat of 60% of the pills contain a lethal dose, I think that that is a message that absolutely has to sit home with people. And I think that we have to provide our uh, loved ones, family members, kids, adults, with a legitimate excuse, right? You have to think about what that excuse is prior. I, I, I tell my kids when it comes to drug, tell, them you, tell people that you're allergic to it because let me tell you, peer pressure is an incredible thing. People will take things, use things simply because everyone else is doing it. And what's scary and incredibly important is because those pills are made with pill presses in clandestine labs, it is very possible that in a, in a pill bottle of 10 pills, three of the 10 pills have no fentanyl in it whatsoever Two of them have the, the right dose to create euphoria, and the remainder are lethal doses because these chemists, they don't know what the hell they're doing. They're mixing it up, they're just putting it together. It's no science behind it. They're just mixing it up. And, and to see somebody, if Dan takes a pill and, 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 and he does fine with it, I may watch him and say, he did fine. I may take the same pill out of the same casing, and that's it for me. And it happens like that. There is no, you know what, I'm feeling a little bit bad. I think I need to call somebody or see somebody. 
This is why this, there's a false narrative out there in a couple of things. One is Narcan is going to help the person who is suffering addiction and using themselves. There's not one case in this country that I'm aware of where somebody was actually overdosing because they took too much drug, a fentanyl overdose, and they self-deployed Narcan and saved their own life. Unless you're tying this around your neck with a sign that says, in case I go unconscious, use this, it's the people who are not using that need to have access to this so we can revive somebody uh, that's there. But this weekend is gonna be incredibly important. It's gonna, I mean, it's gonna be a lot of people who are looking to have a lot of fun and, and, and again, being aware, being informed, and having the tools necessary are, are gonna be crucial to, to not only address this weekend, but, but others as well. Jerry, we can have a little easy on. Uh, I would like to ask how easy is to access to the Narcan? I know young people, you know, are using these drugs, but probably families want to access, how easy is to get it? Yeah, so it, it's incredibly easy to get uh, access to Narcan. Uh, the, the law has been changed where you can get this now in any pharmacy, but if you don't wanna pay for it, if you don't want to pay for it, you want free Narcan, I'm going to encourage you to go to Project Opioid. Uh, I'm on the board of directors. Project Opioid is run by uh, a CEO, Andre Bailey. Go to Project Opioid, contact us through the website, and we will make sure that you get access to naloxone uh, free of charge. So again, it's available. Uh, our state provides it available. It's, it's there through Project Opioid, but you can get your hands on this, get it, keep it, save it. Even if you don't know anybody who's struggling, it's, it's the right thing to do. Eric, you mentioned there's a lot of things that are working, the, the Narcan availability, the Hope and Healing Center, um, the legislature's help. Is there something your department still needs today that would help you? Yeah, I, I think that, great question. I, I think that the biggest thing that, that we need to do is co to continue to come together and change the narrative about what this is. Uh, for some, and I, I speak to audiences across the country, especially here in Central Florida, they walk away surprised and alarmed with the numbers. And for some, there's still this narrative of, it's gotta be somebody who's sleeping under the overpass. It's gotta be somebody who has gone down a path of progressively using uh, harder substances and then ultimately has resulted in this. Or there's clear signs. Let me tell you, most of the people that we're reviving and the tragic fatalities we're seeing are people who are going to work, going to school, they're around other family members and loved ones, and, and they're taking and they're going. What we can do is change the narrative. This is not a situation of trying to make bad people good. It's a situation of trying to make sick people well. And if we treat this with kindness and compassion for at least the people who are dependent and addicted to the substances, uh, it changes what we're able to do. I think that more uh, organizations and agencies should be familiar with what the numbers are in their local area. I think that uh, we need to do all that we can to expand the partnership like we have with Advent Health, and, and media plays a big part in kind of getting that narrative out there. And this is 40,000 pills from just one case. This is just, this is just one delivery. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of pills that, that Dan and our prosecutor and our investigators know about, but this is just like, like Hunter and our confidential informant made one trip to Los Angeles, talked to this to, to, to Rhea, who is again, we believe two levels removed directly from the cartel, a big player in the country, and especially in Los Angeles. And based on that one conversation, it results in one delivery of 40,000 pills. When F40,000 was, was gone, it's very likely 40 was gonna become 60, 60 was be gonna come, become 100. This is how they work. They'll say, we're gonna give you 40,000 pills. And, and you gotta remember, these, these mid-level drug folks are, are making probably an eight or 900% profit. So when the drug dealer goes, they'll purchase those, those 40,000 probably for two or three dollars a pill. And they're gonna sell them on the streets for about $10 a pill. So you're looking at eight or 900% profit and, and a great business for this, this, this relatively small operation here locally. A lot of times I've talked to parents who've lost uh, children and they know that their kids have been struggling in many cases. Would you try to stand right here in front of the microphone? That is relevant, right? What kind of advice do you have for parents who are seeing the same signs that you saw? What advice do you give them to sort of try to prevent something like this? Because uh, I'm sure you look back in hindsight and say, what could I have done differently? Or what, what, what do you know now that you could have done? 
Oh, absolutely. And looking back, um, my son was um, pretty honest about um, his dependency. Um, obviously, I knew that I had taken care of him after um, his surgery, life saving um, by ORMC. He arrived dead uh, to the hospital. They revived him. Vascular team saved his life. Um, I was told um, that he was not. He was going to be brain dead, or um, he was never going to be the same. Um, fortunately, uh, because he was so strong. Um, he came out, uh, they took the tubes out, and he was the same Tristan. Um, but he was an athlete um, and a uh, regular kid, got in you know, regular trouble. He, he, was, he was feisty. He gave me, he gave me a lot. I, I have every gray hair on my head uh, due to Tristan, um, one from my youngest son. Um, but I will tell you, um, watching it, you know, I, I was given the the pills. I brought him the, the Percocet because I, I took care of him at home because he couldn't walk and, and he had a he had a vac, a vac on his leg um, due to the stabbing of his femoral artery and they um, and I gave him the pills. Um, I to answer your question, I believed my son um, was more like me. Um, I could quit anything at any time. Um, and I I shouldn't know. But he got older and, um, you know, moved, moved out, got his own place, so I didn't see him every single day. But there were signs. Um, my youngest son would tell me. Um, and we, we had concerns. My, my parents, everyone had concerns. But he was really smart, and <laughs> he, he could fool me. Um, but I, I, I knew. Um, but he had been going to N.A. He was... Uh, about to get his driver's license back. Um, he was even um, one of the, uh, he was heading one of the, the small groups for NA. Um, he had told me, and I think the warning sign for me or any parent is somebody that struggles with the addiction. He had told me um, that he had found some, I, he didn't say organic, he, he said it was something that helped him not to withdraw from Percocet. Um, and he got it over the counter, those types of things. Obviously, that was untrue. It was um, from people he knew or that he reached out to, but that's how he appeased me. Um, I'll tell you, I don't know anything unless um, the experts can tell me that it's something over the counter. I feel very naive to that at this point, but there's nothing that can take somebody that's going to go through that type of withdrawal um, unless they're getting something um, he had believed it was um, helping him, uh, or that's what he told me. But I had just seen him a few days before he, he was sober. Um, we went through Christmas. Um, I had conversations with him. He was not high. He was not anything. Um, so to prevent it, um, I'm out there. I tell every mom, every dad. Tell your kids, you can't even take somebody's ibuprofen. Don't take marijuana. Don't, don't take anything from somebody unless it's prescribed or you got it in your own bottle um, because you never know. Like the sheriff said, um, I've gone through this since January um, and um, I've been staying very close um, to the sheriff's office and, and, and everything. And they're like, Stacy, I got to go again. And one will die and the other one survives. And these are maybe a couple that have done maybe recreational marijuana or, or recreational cocaine or anything you can name and to show up and one lives, one dies. And they thought it was going to be fine. Um, and I, I know my son did not <laughs> think he was going to pass. Um, but that, that's how I would do it. I would talk to your kids. Don't let them take anything. This is not back when I was young and could just ask for an ibuprofen from somebody. Um, and the signs, you know, if they tell you, oh, I'm okay, um, you know, sometimes, you know, as adults, you know, I couldn't force them to go to, to a facility. Um, but I told them I'll, I'll, I'll give you every dollar I have, send you the best place. Um, but, oh, I'll be okay. Um, this I, I wish I wish I had even known about this um, prior to not that I was with him he was in his own home um, but maybe somebody could have um, saved him with that 
But that's how I would prevent it, is just talk as much. Do not let anybody take any pill or buy it off the streets. But when they're going through the dependency, um, you know, I wish I had, had been able to force him to go. Um, but I thought he was okay. So as we, as we wrap up, I, I again, want to uh, thank you, our media partners, for covering this. Um, I want to uh, especially thank our detectives, because you can have all the policies, the practices, the advocacy, and have all the news conferences you want. Uh, the folks at the Seminole County Sheriff's Office, the detectives, the DEA agents, our partnership there, these are folks that are incredibly passionate about the work that they do. And if it were not for them, none of this would happen. It's them going the extra mile, digging in. They build a personal relationship with the family members of these victims. They are, have a, a, a solid disdain for drug dealers that are, that are dealing in this business, and they will work day and night to make sure that people are accountable to the fullest extent of the law. And I can't mention their names, and I can't bring them forward, but if I could, I can guarantee we, they, we should be giving them the key to the county and the key to the city for what they do. Uh, they're passionate about their work, and, and again, uh, thank you for being here. It happens so easily. I sometimes give the example that we are a naive society. We believe what people tell us. Uh, if, we, if we have a, an iPhone and our cable on our iPhone breaks and we have to get a new one, we can go down to the Apple store and pay whatever Apple's asking for it, or we can get on Amazon or online and order it for a fraction of the cost. That's exactly what's happening with some of these pills. They're saying, I had Percocet, I, I did fine with Percocet. I'm, it looks like it's legitimate, it's branded, it's marketed as legitimate, it's coming to me, and it's nothing but, but fentanyl. But again, uh, our work continues. We are seeing that 21 and 22% decrease in our numbers here, which are still incredibly high numbers, but it's progress, right? And, and again, thank you for being here and thank you for, for doing what you do and thank you to uh, our state attorney's office partners and, and, and Phil Archer for uh, demonstrating the boldness and the courage. Because as far as I know, we lead here in Seminole County, the country, in prosecutions for first degree murder on these drug cases. I don't know of any other county in the country that's doing uh, what we're doing here with these cases. So again, thank you for being here.